Welcome to the Apostolic Keynote Podcast from Kingdom Faith Church. This message is by Colin Urquhart. Now we've been on a journey with the Lord and it was quite obvious yesterday morning when students were making their act of surrender to Jesus, their true repentance that God has been doing a deep work amongst us. Uh, The amount of time that each of you was taking in really working that through with the Lord uh, indicated that. But of course, it's one thing to say I surrender all. It's another thing to actually do it and to see the outworking of it in our lives. So coming to that point opens the way for the lifestyle that God intends us to live subsequent to making such a declaration of our faith and devotion to him. And the key word here is going to become your favorite word, Obedience. Now, in the world, people don't like to obey. And there can be a residue of that in, uh, in Christians. You're taught up, you have to obey your parents, obey at school. If you're in the workplace, you've got to obey your bosses. Uh, we're supposed to obey the government and so on. Life can only be structured in any sensible and meaningful way where there is obedience. Somebody breaks the law, they're actually offending society. So there's a sort of a social aspect to the need of obedience. But in a spiritual context, of course, it's much more serious than that, really. Uh, Jesus is Lord. And the Holy Spirit enables us to proclaim Jesus is Lord. But to say that he's Lord is to say that he is the ultimate authority. And Why people don't like obedience is... Sometimes they're afraid of authority or they don't like authority or they don't want anybody to have authority over them because they want to be free to do what they want. But if we've submitted ourselves to the one who is Lord, we recognize very firmly that we're under his authority. And when you're under authority, the one in authority tells you what to do. Uh, I mentioned last week that everything Jesus told the disciples what to do was issued in the form of a command, a command given in love, but he never said please, he never said would you do this or would you consider doing that. He told them what to do. And this has always been the way in which God has related to his people. He told Adam what he could do in the garden and the one thing he could not do. Uh, Adam, as we know, broke that command with devastating consequences. Uh, And as you trace through the people in the Old Testament, all the people that God raised up and used had to fulfill the commands that God gave them. Noah had to build the ark because he was commanded to do so. And the salvation of his family and himself was actually dependent upon that. That, no doubt, took some time. And to build a ship in the middle of a desert required some persistence in faith. Uh, Moses had to obey the Lord 
and go back to Egypt, although everything within him uh, wanted to do anything but that. It was the last thing in the world that he wanted to do. Uh, he had to obey all the instructions that God gave him when he addressed Pharaoh in, at various times, in various ways. And if uh, the children of Israel hadn't obeyed in putting the blood over the lintels and doorposts, they would have been uh, devastated by the death that enveloped the firstborn of, of Egypt. It's all obvious as you go through Scripture that God's way of directing his people into his purposes is by issuing commands. And it was important to not do anything less than the command or not add to the command. Moses, you remember, was not allowed to enter the promised land because he struck the rock when he wasn't told to. On a previous occasion, he'd been told to strike the rock. On this occasion, he wasn't told that. And you'd think, well, wait a minute, that seems quite uh, a severe punishment for a mistake such as that. But you see, if God is going to use us, he's going to require obedience. And the problem is that uh, most Christians settle for a general sense of obedience, which is what you get in the permissive will of God, but not in his sovereign will. God is a God of detail. And he says we have to prove faithful in little things if he's going to put us in charge of bigger things. So that means we have to be faithful in the little things. Just a general sense of obedience doesn't satisfy or please the Lord. A typical example of this is King Saul in the Old Testament. You remember that when he defeated the Amalekites, he was told to destroy everything um, that belonged to the Amalekites. And, uh, but he kept back the best of the animals and he didn't execute the king of the Amalekites. So Samuel comes to him and confronts him with his disobedience to the Lord. And you see, Saul's answer is, but I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Wow. That seems a severe punishment again, doesn't it? Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. And he tries to excuse himself, as people always do when they're found guilty of disobedience. I was afraid of the people and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sins and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. Samuel is saying, I cannot have fellowship with disobedience. Because Samuel was devoted to the Lord to be obedient to him. Now, you see, to Saul, he thought he had generally fulfilled what God had said, and he had defeated the Amalekites, but he did not obey 
in the detail of what God had said to him. And in what Samuel says to him, he likens this to rebellion uh, and to arrogance. And rebellion is like the sin of divination. Occult. Arrogance, pride, is like the sin of idolatry. So he's saying to Saul, you can't say you obey the Lord at one, on one hand, yet in some of the details of what he's told you to do, you're guilty of rebellion and idolatry. Or what amounts to that? We could go on all the way through the Old Testament and see how God demands obedience. Of course, in the laws he gave to Moses, the whole basis of that is that Israel would be obedient to the commands that God gave them. And we know that they weren't, and they constantly disobeyed and, and therefore grieved the Lord. So if we fast forward to the New Testament, when we come to Jesus, what we see is a man living in submission to the lordship of his father while he was here on earth. A man who obeyed the father in every detail. He spoke no words of his own, did only what he saw the father doing. He made it quite clear that he had come to obey the father and that he obeyed the Father out of love for him. So obedience is put on to another level, really, in the New Testament. It's not less obedience. God still requires absolute obedience to all that he says. But it's an obedience that's going to be born out of love. And... uh, What Jesus is making clear to his disciples is that this has to be a wholehearted and complete disobedience. Now, because of the blood of Jesus, when we disobey, we do not suffer the same punishment as Moses and Saul because Jesus has taken our punishment upon himself. And that's wonderful on the one hand, But there's a dangerous element to it, on the other hand, because it can cause us to think that disobedience doesn't matter all that much because we will be forgiven and there will be no punishment for it. But actually, we are depriving ourselves of the blessings that come with obedience because what Jesus teaches the disciples is that all the blessings of God come within the context of obedience. Now, all last week he was talking to us about abiding in Christ, abiding as branches in the vine, living in Christ, and our inheritance in Christ. And his command is to abide, to rest, to remain, to go on living in him, to rest and remain, uh, go on living in his love. And we know that uh, Jesus said, that um, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. How are we going to remain in his love? How are we going to continue to abide in Jesus and have him continuing to live in us? Well, Jesus says, if you obey my commands, if you obey, If you obey whatever I command you, you will remain in my love. Just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. So Jesus realized that in his whole relationship with the Father, that unity that he had with the Father was dependent upon him obeying the Father in every detail. Just one sin and there would be no salvation for anyone. And Jesus himself would have been lost. That, of course, is unthinkable. 
So Jesus obeyed the Father in every detail. So you will obey, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy complete. And we know that if we continue to live in him, then we have all the wonderful promises that go with that of what God will do in response to prayer and so on. So we have this... um, Jesus also said uh, uh, at the Last Supper, you will continue to live in me if you obey my commands. Well, those who obey my commands continue to live in me, continue to be at one with me, continue in fellowship with me. So obedience isn't an option for Christians. And what we have to do is to get rid of all the negative connotations that goes with that word. All the, all the sort of, we, we, we love to obey. So John, you see, in his first epistle, uh, says that the commands of God are not a burden. You see, if you love him, what he tells you to do is not a burden. In other words, what he does through his commands is tell you what he wants you to do in order to please him, to glorify him, and to fulfill his will and purpose for your life. He knows that when we walk in obedience, we will be able to inherit the promises. We will actually live as those who are able to be co-heirs of Christ, would be able to download all those blessings that are ours in Christ, we will actually prosper through that life of obedience. Now, in order to enable this in a way that wasn't possible under the old covenant, we know that Jesus has done two things. He has given us the precious blood which washes us clean and makes us holy, makes us perfect in his sight, so that there doesn't have to be anything going on in our lives that is counterproductive to that obedience. And then he has given the Holy Spirit to live in us, and the Holy Spirit, of course, is perfect. The Holy Spirit acts in perfect obedience with the Father and the Son, Jesus says he never does anything himself. He never does anything independently of the Father and the Son. So you have the blood that makes you perfect in God's sight and you have the perfectly obedient one living in you. Now that gives us no excuse for disobedience because if we depend upon the Spirit, then we will be obedient in every situation. He will never lead us into disobedience. The Holy Spirit will never lead you in any way that will be contradictory to God's word or to what he has commanded us to do. If we depend upon ourselves, then as people in the Old Testament, we will constantly fail when we want to please ourselves rather than the Lord then we obviously are going to sin and we're obviously not going to move in the purposes of God at that point. So we don't want our lives to be any more of a mixture than is absolutely necessary. I mean, we know that none of us walks perfectly in perfect obedience to God. But there is a difference between deliberate sin and inadvertent sin. You can sin inadvertently because of ignorance. You can think that you're right about something, but you're not in full uh, command of all the facts, so you might be doing something wrong, but not intending to do anything wrong. But it's another matter when we know what the word of God is, we know uh, what his commands are, we know what he's asking of us, and we say no. You see, that to Samuel, was as the sin of divination, of rebellion, of idolatry, because it raises self above God. 
and says, well, I know what God wants, but I'm choosing to do what I want instead. Now, that, of course, would be a contradiction to all that you were saying yesterday in submitting and surrendering yourselves to the Lord. Sadly, every believer does that at times without perhaps appreciating the seriousness of what they're doing. And although God forgives us and doesn't punish us, we lose something spiritually every time that happens. We cannot advance with the Lord in his purposes through disobedience. We can only advance step by step with him by obeying him step by step. And this is what he does with us every day. He tells us to love one another as he has loved us. And so he puts opportunities for us to express that love. And, and when we do so, we are pleasing and glorifying the Lord. When we fail to do so, we're grieving him. And that has some kind of effect upon our relationship with him. And yes, you see, we confess our sins and he restores us. He forgives us, he doesn't judge us and condemn us, but in his love for us, he wants the best for us. And he knows that the best is only to be found in loving obedience to his commands. So what the New Testament talks about is exactly what Jesus was saying to the disciples at the Last Supper, the obedience of love. And Paul says that his apostolic responsibility is to teach people the obedience of faith, faith working through love. So you put these two things together, the obedience of love, the obedience of faith, and they're almost one and the same thing because without faith, um, we cannot please the Lord. And without love, we cannot please him. They're like the two sides of a single coin. If you're moving in the obedience of faith, then you will move in the obedience of love. And if you're moving in the obedience of love, you will move in the obedience of faith. So we come to this key uh, command of love. It's, that's always been God's command. I mean, the summary of the law is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And to this, Jesus added the new command that goes with the new covenant. You are to love one another as I have loved you. So God expresses his will in this command to love. He is holy by nature and his will has always been both Old Testament and New Testament, is that he would have a holy people. Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. But how do you express holiness in practice? You express holiness in love. You express holiness in faith, in dependence upon the Lord. You see, because both those things can only be worked out in your life through dependence upon the Holy Spirit. The love that God has poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit is the perfect love of God. So whenever we depend upon the love of the Holy Spirit within us, we will express something of the perfect love of God, of Jesus, in our lives. He is the spirit of faith. When we depend upon him, he will enable us to overcome whatever is a contradiction to love in our own lives, in the circumstances around us, and even in the lives of other people. So everything is really sort of funneled, if you like, into this whole concept of obeying the Lord. And Jesus was not afraid to preach that and to teach that to his disciples. And at the Last Supper, he's making this absolutely clear. You will continue to live in me and you will continue to love in, in my love if you obey my commands. That's the condition. You will not continue in my love if you don't obey my commands. Doesn't mean he won't love you, but you won't live in his love. So the only way to live in his love is through obedience to him. And what Jesus is impressing upon the disciples is that this is the joyful way to live. 
it, 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 and, and as John says, the burden, the, the commands of God are not a burden. It's not that God is putting burdens upon us. In fact, he says, come and be yoked together with me. If you're yoked together with me, you'll walk together with me, but I'll take the strain and I will enable you, you see, to do whatever it is that I'm wanting you to do. You can't be yoked together with Jesus if you walk in your own way, if you walk in independence, because he's not going to leave the way in which he walks to go with you. Uh, if, if you want to put it in the context of... Uh, the parable of, about the prodigal son, the father would not go and join the, the prodigal son in the place of his sin in order to deliver him. He waited for him to come back to the place of obedience. He, the father was not going to depart from his way just for the sake of the disobedient son. So, uh, so with God, he, he does not go with us into the realms of sin. He maintains his holiness and righteousness. If you like to put it in a biblical sense, he walks on the highway of holiness and he waits for us to come back to that highway. Now, God is not laying a burden on us by talking to us like this at this point. We believe that God wants to do a new and more expansive thing amongst us. Faith camp has ended and all the blessing that brought to thousands of people, but something greater God wants to break out of our lives. Okay, that's only going to come through obedience. There's no other way that it will come. It'll have to be the work of the Holy Spirit, but it will be obedience to the leading of the Spirit. It will be dependence upon the Spirit, which is what God is commanding us to do. So the new thing is not going to be just new, some new event or uh, something like that. It's going to come out of a deeper level of obedience to God which enables a closer walk with God, which enables us being more like Jesus. And you see, the closer your walk, the closer your fellowship with the Father and the Son, <clears throat> excuse me, the closer your fellowship, the more like Jesus you become, the more he is able to do through your life. So what God is really saying to us, what I need for the greater thing that you want to see and that this nation needs, and the other nations in Europe also need, what I must have is a people who are devoted to me in loving obedience. A people who really desire to be the holy people that I call them to be, the people of love, the people of faith, the people of dependence. Now, you can see immediately that this is a matter of degree. That we already love the Lord and there is already um, considerable love spread amongst us. But God is saying there's a further place to go where the love will be greater. We would also be, a, you could also say we are a people of faith. This is kingdom faith. Our faith is in the Lord. Our faith is in his word. And we see a certain amount uh, that is the result of faith and the way that God answers prayer and the healings that take place and the miracles he performs and so on. But we know God is able to do much more than we see. So there is another level of faith. Just as there is another level of love, there is another level of faith. There's another level of dependence upon him. So that is another way of saying there is another level of surrender to him. And I believe that what God was doing among you students last week was taking you to another level of surrender. I believe what was happening yesterday was a deeper level of surrender than we had last year in the college. And that's not 
downgrading what happened last year. It's just saying that God is doing an even deeper work. We had a great year last year, as you second year students know, but God is doing a deeper work, a more thorough work. You could say a greater work amongst us. But this is only the beginning, you see, of, of preparing the way for the greater thing that he is going to do. Because this is what we need, isn't it? it you know, don't start calling it names like revival or anything else. All, all we need to do is to keep our focus day by day, step by step on G, with Jesus. Because, you see, the greater thing is not going to happen just through some general sense of obedience in our lives. It's going to come out of being lovingly submitted to him in the details. Amen? You see, if you walk step by step, he wants love in this step and love in that step. And the more that the Holy Spirit is operating in our lives, the more we experience what is called the witness of the Spirit. And when we are alert to the witness of the Spirit, you feel terrible about the smallest of sins. The smallest of things. Things that beforehand you wouldn't even bother to have confessed as sin. But you see, the closer you get to the Lord, the, 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 the closer you get to him in his love and in his holiness, the more you become aware of what he regards as sin, what he sees, what he desires, what he wants. And some fiddling little thing, I mean, you've, you've heard me say before that when we've been in times of uh, living really close to God in his holiness, he would not allow us to pray together if anybody had had a wrong thought about anyone else. That wrong thought would have to be confessed and forgiven, and then we could pray. Now, that's a high level of spiritual life, see? But that's the kind of level that God is taking us to. Because it's out of that that you see the power of God moving in the most amazing ways. Because at that level you're living closer to God, closer to him in his love, in his holiness, in obedience to him. So even the little things you realize grieve the Lord. The Holy Spirit convicts you. I mean, that's quite something of the Holy Spirit saying, you cannot pray until you get that right. And that's just one person present having one wrong thought about someone else who is present. But that's the Lord. That's the level at which he wants us to function, to live. Now, you cannot do that through your own self-effort. It has to be the working of the Spirit within you. It has to be Christ in you. And you see, this is why. There's a sort of catch-22 thing here. Jesus says... You can only live like that by abiding in him. And you can only abide in him if you live like that. If you continue in his love. To obey him. So, you know, there's a... Uh, both these things interact. So this is why in yielding ourselves to God, what we are in fact doing is placing ourselves in greater dependence upon the Holy Spirit, saying, Holy Spirit, I cannot do anything apart from you. I can't please the Lord today apart from you. I can't walk in love apart from you. I cannot obey the Lord today apart from you. 
I'm just totally dependent upon you. Now, that means that your longing and your desire is for the Holy Spirit to have deeper, more full control, really, in your life. Paul talks about the control of the Holy Spirit when he's writing to the Romans. You want to submit yourself so that really the Holy Spirit is in charge of what's going on in your life. Now, you see, <clears throat> the problem, my friends, is that most Christians do not regard the Holy Spirit in that way. They think of, okay, God has called them, saved them, given them this gift of the Holy Spirit. Now it's up to them to live a, a more or less godly life, to live as a Christian. And the Holy Spirit is around to help you when you're in trouble, when you're finding it difficult. Holy Spirit, help me. That is, that is just a travesty of the Christian life. That is not what the Christian life is about at all. Because help me says I'm still doing it. I'm still in control. And the Holy Spirit is just there as a sort of a, a, a fall guy. When, when I can't manage, I'll call upon the Holy Spirit. You see, that is a total, total misunderstanding of the Christian life. That actually you and I cannot live the Christian life. We are totally, totally incapable of doing that. The only person that could live the life that pleased God on earth was Jesus. The only one who can do it now is the Holy Spirit. And therefore, the Holy Spirit has to work it out in, in the life of believers, those who depend upon him. He is not there just for us to call upon him when we're in trouble or when we need healing or when there's something that we're confronted with that we can't do in the natural no, 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 no. Jesus did not die to make you a better you, as we saw last week. He died to replace you with Christ in you. He died to replace the self-life with the God life. And this is why the scripture says, aim at godliness, aim at perfection, aim at depending upon the perfect one that God has put within you. So the Holy Spirit will always enable what it is that God is wanting in our lives. Now, of course, if you do not obey the leading of the Spirit, then you're actually creating tension between yourself and the very one upon whom you need to depend in order to live the life that God is calling you to live. So... It's a matter of not just having a personal relationship with the Father or a personal relationship with the Son. We need also a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. Our fellowship, the sharing of life, is with the Holy Spirit. Amen? The fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. The end of 2 Corinthians, yes? The fellowship, the sharing of life, uh, of the Holy Spirit be with you always, all the time, all the time. You're living in that fellowship, in that sharing of the Holy Spirit. So <clears throat> when we, inverted commas, seek the Lord or meet with God or encounter him, what are we actually looking for? What do we want the product of that seeking of God to be? And the answer to that is, well, we want more of the Spirit to be evident in our lives. We want to have encounter with God that is going to release more of the Spirit, more of his love, more of his life, more of his power in our lives. This is why... When that happens, you see so much more fruit. You see so many greater things happening. Because the Holy Spirit is given more opportunity to actually work in and through his people. 
So <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is what his name implies, the spirit of holiness. He's the spirit of truth that God says, that Jesus says, who will guide us into all the truth. And if we know the truth, then the truth will set us free. So you see, all the time, the Holy Spirit wants to bring us into greater spiritual freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But that's not freedom to do what you want. It's freedom to fulfill the will and purpose of God. It's the freedom that you have to obey the Lord out of love with joy in your heart. It pleases you to know that you've pleased the Lord. You are full of joy because you know the Lord is rejoicing over you through the loving obedience that has been expressed in your life, not because you have done something, but because of your dependence upon the Holy Spirit that has enabled him to do stuff in you and through you. So that sort of surrender and submission to the Holy Spirit is is a constant thing. Before ever you hear me speak, before ever in, in a lecture or anything here, like this morning, I always make a fresh surrender of myself to the Holy Spirit. Because I don't want to speak. I've got nothing to say. All I want is for the Holy Spirit to speak through me and to work through me. But, you know, that's how Jesus operated. Father speaking through, through the Son. This is how we are to operate. It's all the activity of the Spirit, of course, which is why Jesus didn't begin his ministry until the Spirit came upon him after his baptism uh, by John the Baptist. Everything in Jesus' life was done in the power of the Spirit. And that's, that is godliness. That is our aim. Everything be done in the name of Jesus. Whatever you do, Paul says to the Colossians, whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Don't, can you understand? You cannot do anything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ unless it is done in the power of the Spirit. You're not doing it in his name if you do it in your own strength. You're doing it in your name. But if you're doing it in the name of Jesus, you're doing it in the name, you're, you're doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit. So God is simply calling us to a greater dependence upon the Holy Spirit to stay in that place of being yielded and surrendered to God so that the Holy Spirit can have greater and more powerful effect upon our lives. Now, one last thing we, we need to understand. Jesus was talking to us all last week about remaining in him, abiding in him, resting in him, continuously living in him. Now he says that we can only do that by obeying his commands. So what this means is we're submitted to him for a life of continual obedience. Not just general obedience, which we think will give us pass marks on the day of judgment, but continual loving submission to the one who loves us. We can only love because he first loves us. Continual dependence upon the Holy Spirit. Continually praying that the Holy Spirit will speak through us, work through us, love through us, enable us to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's an impossible life without the Holy Spirit. But it's the life to which God calls every believer. It's the life that disciples seek to live. 
And it's the life he has made possible through the anointing of his Holy Spirit. So you see, John reminds his readers in the first letter, you have received the anointing of the Holy One. And that anointing remains. God never takes the anointing away. So even if you disobey, God doesn't remove the Holy Spirit. You don't lose the Holy Spirit through disobedience because everybody in this room would have lost the Spirit by now if that was the case. No, no. The anointing remains. But the reason why God has anointed us is to live in the good of the anointing. Now you see, Saul lost the anointing to be king. Uh, He remained king until his death. But he lived his latter years under the rejection of Jesus, of, of God, instead of under the anointing of God. David still wouldn't kill him, although he could do, could have done, because he respected the anointing that was upon him. He would never, ever do anything against anyone who carried the anointing of God, because the call and the anointing go together. So he, he would never do that. He had too much respect for the anointing. But you see, Saul's mistake is that he did not depend upon the anointing for the details of what God was wanting him to do. He thought just a general sense of obedience to what he'd said would be enough. So we need to be delivered from that kind of deception, if any of us have it, and to realize, okay, God has not called me to his permissive will, but to his sovereign will. And according to his sovereign will, I want to do day by day what pleases him. I want to, I want to live in fellowship with God. Right at the beginning of his first letter, John says, our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. And then Paul talks about the fellowship with the Holy Spirit. You see, our fellowship, our sharing of life is with the whole trinity of God. Now, this means, if we take this seriously, when we pray and seek God, when we meet together here at 8 o'clock and at other times, there is a passion in our hearts, a longing in our hearts for more of the Spirit of God to be released in our lives. That's what we're crying out for. That's what we're crying out for. What we need more than anything else at this time is to encounter God in his holiness. To really meet with God again and again in his holiness. Not, I'm not talking about just having a sense of his holy presence. But to meet with him. So that he will impact us further, more deeply. With his spirit of holiness. Because you see when that spirit really grips your heart. There's only one thing you want to do. And that's to love Jesus. That's to obey Jesus. That's to please Jesus. That's to glorify the Father. That's all you want to do. You're not fighting with the flesh and with the things of self that rise up against the will and purpose of God. By the power of his spirit, you no longer want or desire to please your flesh or to satisfy yourself. That is possible. I've been there. 
And by the grace of God, I'm going back there. But I'm not going alone. You're coming with me. We're all, we're all going together. Because then we will be in the midst of the greater thing that God wants. And wherever you go, we will be a blessing to hundreds, to thousands because of what we're carrying of the presence and the power and the love of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So every time of meeting together is not, this is just another eight o'clock. No, no, no. Don't even bother to come if that's your attitude. Go and find something else to do with your life. No, you come here and you have that passion and that desire. Lord, I want to meet with you. I want your Holy Spirit to take whole of my life in greater and greater measure in deeper ways take hold of my life take hold of my life that's what it's about that's why God supplied the Holy Spirit that's why he told them don't go and try to do anything until the anointing comes upon you when that that spirit of holiness came upon them. 3,000 came to the Lord first day. That wasn't a bad start, was it? Then 5,000. Well, nothing's impossible for God. We will see hundreds, we will see thousands coming to the Lord. It's, it's a word to us. 5,000 households. It's about 20,000 people. It's not going to happen out of where we are now but it's going to happen out of where God is going to take us. The greater thing. Amen. Come on, let's all stand. Come into the middle. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. So just respond to what God has been saying. Because silence doesn't really speak of passion. We needed silence yesterday. But today, God needs to hear the cry of our hearts. What we desire, what we long for. More of him. More of you, Lord. More of you in my life. More of you in my thinking. More of you in my speaking more of you in my actions so that I can do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the power of your spirit come on get real get real don't be, don't be religious don't be religious don't hold back just because there's other people here you just cry out to God from what is in your heart Oh, Jesus, 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 your spirit, Lord. I want your spirit released in every area of my life. I want more of your spirit to overflow in my life, Lord. Oh, ratapari a little papapara zandari a little papapara zandari a little papakara zita. Oh, ratapari a little papapara zandari. Basta kalari a little papapakala zita di sandama. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And you say to the Lord, Lord, I want a life of loving obedience to you. I mean, come and tell him that. Don't, don't just repeat my words, but tell him that. Lord, that's what I desire. If you don't desire it, ask him to bring you to the place where you do desire it. Lord, that I desire your will above my own. Thank you that Jesus said that he hadn't come to fulfill his own will, but your will, because you sent him. And Lord, I don't want 
to fulfill my will, my plans, my ideas, my agenda. I want your plan, Lord. I want your purpose. I want to obey you. I want to, Lord. I know that wanting to isn't the same as doing it. But I know I can't do it if I don't want to do it. So, Lord, I want to obey you in the details, not just in a general sense. I want to walk with you day by day in loving obedience. I want each step that I take to be a step of loving obedience. Not because I ought to, but because I want to. I want to please you. I want to glorify you. I want to honor you through loving obedience to your will in my heart and in my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This is my heart desire. This is my heart longing. And Lord, I want to see this outworked in all the details of my life. Not just in some general sense. I don't want to do anything that will grieve you. I don't want to do anything that would dishonor you. I don't want to praise you with my lips one moment and then make decisions that are dishonoring you the next moment. No, Lord, I want that holy consistency in my life. And I thank you and I praise you and I bless you. I know it has to be the work of your spirit within me, Lord. I know this is freedom, Lord. You're leading me into a place of greater freedom. Greater freedom in the spirit. Greater freedom to love. Greater freedom in seeing your life and your power pouring in and through and out of my life. Thank you, Lord. You will never reduce your standards for the sake of any of us. That what we're talking about is the life of your kingdom. I want that kingdom life. I want you to rule and to reign in my life, Lord. I want you to rule and reign in all the details. I don't want even any wrong thoughts about anybody else or about anything. I, I, Lord, I want, I want Holy Spirit thinking. I want Holy Spirit speaking. I want Holy Spirit action in my life. Pura taparia leto papaparazandama. Bapaparazandaria leto papapakalasinama. Oh, hallelujah. Is there a passionate desire for these things? Is that what I'm hearing? Papaparazandaria lenama. You can agree because you know what I'm saying is right, or you can passionately desire what I'm saying because it's right. Just agreeing won't get you anywhere. More of you, Lord. More of your life. More of your life, Lord, being expressed in my life. More of your love. More of your love, Lord. Give me eyes of love, Lord. That when I look upon people, I will look at them through your eyes of love. Let, let your love just so take hold of my heart, Lord. That love that you poured into my heart by the Holy Spirit. 
I don't want I don't want a divided heart. I don't want any impurity in my heart. I don't want any selfishness in my heart. I don't want any pride of heart. I want Holy Spirit love in my heart. Popapara Sandaria Lenoma. I want Holy Spirit submission to you, Father, to you, Jesus, in fellowship with you, Lord. Popapara Sandaria Leto Papapara Zandama. O papara sandalia leto papapara sitri sandama. Pasta galaria leto papapara sandalia leto papapara sinama. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Papara sandalia leto papara sandalia leno mazundama. Pasta galaria leto papapara sandalia leno mazundama. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. These things don't happen by thinking about them, but only by earnestly desiring them. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, papara sandalia leto papakalasinama. Oh, papara sandalia leto papakalasinama. Oh, Lord, Lord, let this be the earnest desire of every one of our hearts. Popara sandalia leto papakalasinama. That we will be like Jacob and, and, and we will not, we will, we will just keep on seeking you until you bless us in the way we need to be blessed, until we see that release of your spirit in our lives in a greater measure than we've ever known. Papara Sandaria Leto Papapakala Sinama. Papara Leto Papapakala Sandama. We don't believe we need to wrestle with you as Jacob did. We just need to be available to you, Lord, to be open to you. Torah Bakara Sinema. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Papara Sandaria Leto Papara Sandama. Bastakalaria Leto Papara Sandaria Leto Papara Sidari Sandama. Oh, Papara Sandaria Leto Papara Sandaria Leto Papara Sidama. Oh, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Pura taparia leto papara sandaria leto papara sanuma. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Pura taparia leto papara sidari sanduma. Oh, papara sandaria leto papara sanduma. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, may we be sensitive to the witness of your spirit. Hearing readily what you're saying to us day by day, responding readily to what you say, just learning to trust you, learning to obey you, step by step along the way in which you lead us. Thank you, Jesus. This isn't just a good idea, it's the will of God, isn't it? We would walk as Jesus did. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Popapara sandaria leto papapara sandaria leto papapara sinum. Pasta galaria leto papapara sandaria leto papapara sinum. Pastor Galaria Leto Papa Pacala Sidri Sandama Papa Para Sandaria Leto Papa Pacala Sidri Sandama. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Poor Atapari Leto Papa Pacala Sandaria Lena Sandama. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Papara sandaria leto papapakala sitri sandama. O papara sandaria leto papapakala sitri sandama. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Papara sandaria leto papapara sitri sandama. Basta galaria leto papapara sandaria leno masundama. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Palatabali a little papa para sandalama. Thank you, Jesus. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I too will love him and reveal myself to him. If anyone loves me, he will obey my words. My Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. The world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. That's what Jesus said immediately before he says, I am the true vine and you are the branches. We live in the one who did exactly what his father commanded him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. just need that love, Lord, that love of your Spirit to take hold of us, that out of that love we will want to obey you in all things and at all times. We don't want patchy love, sporadic obedience, just general obedience but in all things at all times because that is your will. We thank you, Jesus. Papa para santaria leto, papa para sita di santo. Balantaria leto, papa para sita di santaria leto, papa para santo. Papa para sandaria leto, papa para sita di sandama sondama. Basta calaria leto, papa para sandaria leto, papa para sita di sandama. Basta calaria leto, papa para sandaria leto, papa para cala sita di sandaria leto, papa para cala sandama. Basta calaria leto, papa para sandaria leno ma sondama. Papa para sandaria leto papa para cala sita di sandama. 
Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Praise you, Jesus. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. <coughs> everything that the Father has, everything that the Son has, the Holy Spirit makes known to us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Thank you, Lord. Sandaria letto papa para sandaria letto papa para si. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. There's an old chorus. That Again, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. All I ask is to be like him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete amongst us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world, we are like him. 
There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. If our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Lord, the evidence of your word is so overwhelming. Again and again you say to us, that if we love you, we will obey your commands. And they will not be a burden, but they will be a joy to us. So we thank you, Lord, that you are stirring our hearts in these days, purifying our hearts, straining out of our hearts, all those things of self stand in the way of your best purposes. Bringing us to the place where we not only submit ourselves to you as we have done, but we desire to be like you. We desire to be what you have called us to be. So we praise you, Lord. We bless you. We thank you. Let's just praise the Lord. Takara pa sandalia leto pa pa para sandalia leto pa pa para sandama. Basta galaria leto pa pa para sandalia leto pa pa para sitri sandama. Basta galaria leto pa pa para sandalia leto pa pa para sitri sandama. Pasta calaria leto papa para sandaria leto papa para sitri santama. Pasta calaria leto papa para sandaria leto papa para cala sitri santama. O papa para sandaria leto papa para cala sitri santama. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you're not the God who brings us to the point of birth without enabling the birth to take place. And we thank you, Lord, that we will see the birth of all the new things that you need to do in and among us to take us into that place of greater blessing, of greater fruitfulness, 
of greater effectiveness as your kingdom people. And we bless and praise your wonderful name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources from Kingdom Faith and our other audio and video podcasts, please visit www.kingdomfaith.com.